At one point in your life, you're gonna ask yourself the question, what is the meaning of it? What's the point? And you're gonna think about that question long and hard until you find an answer that satisfies you. Some people believe they've found the answer to that question. And others may spend their entire lifetime searching for one that gives their life purpose. In fact, they may never find it. So in today's episode, we're gonna try and answer the question, what is the meaning of life? I'm Dame Scotting, and this is the season two finale of Astronomical. So in order to answer the question, what is the meaning of life? We need to look back to how life first began which means we need to go back 13.78 billion years to the beginning of our universe. The Big Bang. The Big Bang wasn't an explosion as per se, it was the beginning of space and time itself. Everything you see around you, all matter, originated from the Big Bang. You, me, the bees, the trees, everything came from this singularity. A point of infinite density that expanded faster than the speed of light and cooled rapidly. The universe began to cool and eventually formed the very first stars, which would go on to form galaxies much like our very own Milky Way. Now although we can't tell what came immediately before the Big Bang, we do have a good idea of how our universe started. We also have a good idea of how it may end. And that could be through one of three different ways. You have the big freeze, the big rip, and the big bounce. All of these scenarios depend on the density of our universe. The big freeze in this scenario is where the universe continues to expand at an accelerating rate. All of the stars exhaust their fuel and eventually die out. In fact, even black holes slowly evaporate through Hawking radiation. And eventually the universe reaches a state of maximum entropy, where nothing happens and nothing keeps happening forever. Time eventually becomes meaningless. Or the universe could end in a scenario known as the Big Rip. In this case, the universe continues to expand at an ever-accelerating rate and to the point where not only are galaxies and solar systems ripped apart, but subatomic particles are. Nothing will remain in our galaxy. A very brutal end. And then finally, we have the big bounce. Now in this case, the universe doesn't continue to expand. Instead, it contracts in on itself. So whereas we began with the big bang and slowly after time, stars began to form and galaxies. When the universe contracts in on itself, all of this will begin to coalesce until eventually we reach a point of infinite density, a singularity, which could lead to the birth of a new universe. And in this cyclic model, universes continue to oscillate between birth and death over and over again, perhaps forever. Now out of these three scenarios, perhaps the big bounce is the most comforting. And I say that because there is a definitive end. With the others, we wouldn't be around to see how the universe did end. But speaking of which, we ourselves will not be around to see how the universe ends. Our lifetimes are very short compared to the scale of the universe. Which means the question, what is the meaning of life, has to be more personal for us. If we want an answer that applies to us independently rather than the species of human, we need to look on a much smaller scale. So now we're going to explore three different schools of thought. These are three of the most popular outlooks and answers to the question, what is the meaning of life? We have the humanists. Religion. Uh, existential nihilism. Humanists believe that we have the right and responsibility to shape our own lives. Together we derive a moral code from the lessons of history, our personal experiences and our own thoughts. Science provides us with the only knowledge there is about our universe and that knowledge says that this is our only life. There is no afterlife and there is no reincarnation. 
this is all there is. They believe that we each make our own independent choices that shape our life. There is no influence from supernatural beings, which means the personal relations we make as humans are important and crucial towards the happiness of humanity. For a humanist, the bottom line is essentially that you are in charge of your own happiness and are free to determine what you think is the meaning of life. Now, there are many different religious viewpoints towards what is the meaning of life, but they all seem to have a very similar basis, and that is that there is a god or gods, a creator, a supernatural being who produced everything we see around us and gave us life. And to them, we should be grateful and appreciative of what they have produced. Some religions believe that your actions here on earth are a test for where you will go in your next life, whether it be the afterlife or reincarnation. They believe that our main purpose here on earth is to contribute to the well-being and spirit of others. And by showing a strong devotion to God, we will follow a path that is more enlightened. Your purpose here on earth is to serve humankind, to prepare, to meet and become more like God, to choose good over evil and ultimately have joy. Oh, is it me now? Okay, it's me, it's me. Uh, existential nihilism. So this is based on the belief that there is no supernatural being that determines the essence of our life and life has no meaning. It is up to us to decide for ourselves if there is any purpose to life by setting goals that inspire us. The universe is a huge place and we are not at the center of it. The stars in the night sky, they do not twinkle for us. The immense scale of the cosmos is unimaginable. We cannot comprehend it and it is surely not built for us and us alone. Our lives are completely meaningless and you will soon be forgotten. Collectively, we are insignificant specks of dust floating around aimlessly in a distant remote corner of our universe as it continues to expand at an ever accelerating rate, meaning we are all devoid of any meaning. Holy Jeez. F Are you okay? Do you, do you need a hug? Oh my god. Well, it's the truth, innit? <laughs> Holy sh. So, to summarize, you decide the meaning of life. God gives your life meaning. There is no meaning to life. Now each of those groups raise a number of interesting points, which makes it difficult to assign yourself to just one of them. You may not believe in devoting your life to God, but you might agree that there is a God. The universe surely needed a creator. Yes, the universe is huge, and our actions seem inconsequential in the grand scheme of things. But that doesn't mean we can't find a purpose for our lives, even if that purpose is simply to make the lives of others better. In terms of one-lined definitive solutions to the question, what is the meaning of life? Here are eight of the most popular answers. The first one is, the meaning of life is to live forever or die trying. The goal of every cell is to become two cells. To become the best version of yourself. To seek wisdom, avoid suffering, by ignorance and above all else find happiness to leave the world in a better place than you found it to devote your life to god or the creator they have given you life here on earth to become the best version of yourself life has no meaning our existence occurred by random chance and anything that occurs by chance has no purpose or meaning in our universe and then finally the last answer is that the answer to the meaning of life is too profound for us to understand. You will never live a full life if you spend it seeking an answer to a question you will never fully understand. In about 60 seconds time, something very special is going to appear in our night sky. Something that up until two years ago, no one had ever seen before. A sight that would have sent our ancestors crazy. It might look like the beginning of the end, but it's actually just the beginning of a much brighter future. Here we go.
These tiny bright lights in the night sky are not stars, planes or planets. They are satellites. Passing overhead are 60 of the Starlink satellites, which will go on to form a constellation that surrounds our planet. Ultimately, these satellites will work together in order to provide you with internet anywhere on the planet. It doesn't matter whether you're in the middle of a city or if you're in the middle of a desert. You will be connected anywhere on our planet. The launch of these satellites marks the beginning of a new golden age of information. One that knows no limits or boundaries. Knowledge is now accessible to anyone and everyone. We are now more connected than ever, and yet for some of us, we feel at our loneliest. For the vast majority of us, the meaning of life is derived from the personal relations we have with others. The last year has put a seemingly relentless strain on that connection. Our only window to the rest of the world has been through the internet, which has led to cases of loneliness rising more and more. In these dire situations, people find themselves now more than ever asking the question, what really is the meaning of life? From a biological standpoint, our purpose in life is simply to reproduce, to spread across as much of our environment as possible, which we are very good at. There isn't an area on our planet which we are yet to colonize. Even the most inhospitable places like Antarctica have seen humans born and raised there. By default, we are not supposed to be happy. A state of contentment is discouraged because it makes us vulnerable to predators. Human beings are very social creatures. We are only here where we are today because our ancestors worked together to survive. It's the relationships we make in life that give our life meaning and purpose. And that is why loneliness is so toxic and it kills twice as many people as obesity does. There is no definitive answer to the question, what is the meaning of life? And that's because it varies so dramatically depending on the scale at which you try and answer the question. If you try and answer it on the scale of our cosmos, then you simply don't have enough information. We haven't explored enough of our universe to answer why it's here and what its purpose is. But if you turn to that question on the scale of our species, then we know that our purpose is to reproduce and colonize as much of our universe as possible. And then finally, on the scale of humans, the answer can be found through relations we make with other people. The answer to the meaning of life is love. Love what you do. Love the people around you. And then you will love the life that you live. By making others happy, we make ourselves happy. And vice versa. It is only by working together that we stand a chance of figuring out what a definitive answer to the meaning of life may be. Answering the question, what is the meaning of life on the basis of our lifetimes, means that there is no right answer because we simply don't have enough information to correctly answer the question. But it also means that there is no wrong answer. It is up to you to choose what your purpose is. For me, the purpose of my life for the last six years has been to make this documentary which I can happily now say has succeeded. I've done it. But it didn't seem like it was ever gonna happen. It wasn't until four years ago that I recorded the first piece for Astronomical. And even then, it wasn't in front of a video camera because I was too shy. It was just a voice note of me talking about Jupiter and its moons. And I can say now in hindsight that that voice note was awful. It was absolutely horrendous. It's a bit like when you sing along to a song and you think you sound pretty good, so you then record your voice separately without any music and listen back to it, and then you realize you can't sing at all. Fly me to the moon, let me play among the stars. Everything I was saying was completely rushed. I was stuttering a lot. I was really nervous, even though it was just me talking to my phone. No one else was gonna see at that point. It was just for me, and yet it sounded awful. I was yet to step in front of a camera and I couldn't get this part right. So I continued practicing over and over again. 
The solution was to just keep talking to camera until it felt completely natural. Eventually, I didn't feel any pressure or nerves, and my voice stopped being so shaky. So three years ago, I decided it was finally time to start filming the documentary. I knew that in order for this documentary to be gripping, I had to make it visually appealing, so the viewers would stay tuned in for longer than if I was just talking in front of a whiteboard. I planned a solo trip across Europe, in which I would visit some spectacular landscapes. The first on my list was a place known as Lake Bled in Slovenia. I had already prepared the shooting locations at home using Google Maps, I had recited the scripts to memory, all that was left now was to go out and record it. But regardless of how much you plan, there are still things you cannot anticipate for. One of those things is that a group of 40 Chinese tourists arrive the moment you start recording, and as well as taking photos of the castle that have you in it, they also take images of just you, which doesn't exactly do wonders for your self-confidence. Alongside this, the lighting and sound quality were awful, but I didn't notice this until I got back to the hotel room. It was only once I got back to the hotel that I realised I couldn't do this alone, I needed someone to help me out. To tell me if things didn't look great or if it sounded awful. So I headed back home having learnt a lot. I still hadn't told anyone about the documentary. I wanted to make it first and then show people. But then on a Friday night at the casino I told my best friend Sachin about what I was trying to do and he couldn't have been more supportive. Over the next year, we drew up plans to travel across the Americas and film this documentary. During this time, I was still studying astrophysics and cosmology at university full time. But in order to afford these trips, I took a full time job at the National Space Center, which was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. I was doing just enough to scrape by in terms of grades until day one of our trip to the Americas, whilst waiting to board our plane, Sachin read out my grades which said I'd failed one of my modules. Physics 4, 18 MAC 108, score 36. I did retake it after the trip and pass, but it wasn't the best way to start this adventure. Already, the benefits of having someone to help make the documentary were apparent. The stress of traveling was greatly reduced. I don't know what a lentil is. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you know pie. You know pie, but you yeah, don't know what a lentil, lentil is. is. No. Lentil's like... Ah, that's a lentil. They're lentils. We got the footage we needed, and the destinations we wanted it to be filmed at. But still, something wasn't right. Seven wonders of the world. Alongside the likes of the Colosseum, Great Pyramids of Giza, and Chichen Itza. This is Machu Picchu. Oh. <laughs> I'm so hungry. What do you say? Machu oh. Picchu, yeah. The majority of the footage was rushed. We only ever spent a couple of days in a country and then only a few hours where we wanted to film. Blackjack. <laughs> I had two weeks off from work and university. I was leaving the day after an assignment hand in. Although we had been playing this for a while, it felt like it was coming and going too quickly. Once we got back from the trip, I looked over the footage and I realized much like the Europe trip, I had barely got anywhere near enough footage to make a documentary. Something had to change. I was still determined to make the documentary though. It still felt like this was my purpose. So any spare moment I had at work, I spent planning a new trip which unfortunately had to now be solo. I traveled to the Maldives in order to film the opening sequence of season one, hoping that nothing could be better or more engaging as a backdrop than the candy floss skies of the Maldives. I was up all night hoping to capture the starry skies free from the light pollution of the cities, but the clouds wouldn't allow it. The first ever take for the opening sequence of Astronomical Episode 1 was done just after 5 a.m. But I wanted this to be perfect, so I redid the scene over and over again. 37 times to be exact. I had been repeating the same lines along that beachfront for 2 hours and 12 minutes before I felt that I had got the shot that I wanted. By which point, the rest of the island was now awake. It was only when I got home I realised that the first take was the best and the rest of the shots were now meaningless. 
This destination was the first in a long trip, but it proved to be vital because after leaving the Maldives, my confidence was sky high. I really felt like the ball was now finally rolling in terms of this documentary being made. Almost half of the footage in season one was created from this one trip. Although it wasn't perfect and there were plenty of moments where the camera was out of focus or the lens was fogged up, or maybe the mic wasn't properly connected, I still had achieved what I set out to do. Light isn't actually instantaneous. Light is the fastest thing in the universe. Astronomical was now finally becoming a thing. Once I returned from the trip, I knew that this was working. So I spent the rest of summer shooting and editing, but at a snail's pace. Today is a very special day. I knew that in order to finish this and for it to really work, I had to quit my job. And today is my last day at the National Space Center. And I say that lightly because I absolutely loved and adored my job at the National Space Center. After leaving the Space Center, I finished off season one by filming scenes in Mauritius and Dubai, trying to utilize the environment and make the documentary as engaging as I possibly could. And then on April 26th, 2020, I released the first ever episode of Astronomical. Which then leads us to today. 6th of June, 2021. Today is the last ever episode of Astronomical. Now, for the last two years, Astronomical has been the main focus in my life. It's been my main purpose, but it has now come to an end. That's for a number of different reasons, but the main one being that I can't finance myself whilst making these documentaries, because I'm not exaggerating when I say that I spend almost every waking hour working on this to make it as entertaining as possible. The goal was to make something that I would watch myself, and I think I've done that. But sadly, I didn't build enough of an audience to keep it going. I know sometimes you have to let these things sit for a while because eventually they will pick up, but I just don't have the time to keep working on it. But silver lining is that last month I got accepted on a teacher training program, which means I am going to become a certified teacher. Okay, so for the final moments of Astronomical, I'm going to set the camera up to record the night sky so that you can admire our universe for one last time during this series. And I just want to thank all of the people that helped me along the way, because if it weren't for some of the connections that I made, I probably wouldn't have made it past episode three. I would have given up a long time ago because it is a lot of work put into it. Um, but seeing how happy and engaged certain people have been has made it all worthwhile. So, for one final time, I'm Damon Scotting. 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 And this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this was astronomical. There we go. We're done.